Welcome to Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. Join our host, certified clinical mental health counselor and Christian psychotherapist, Dr. Frida Cruz, and her guests as they discuss real-life issues and offer expert clinical advice and solid biblical application for any and all life situations. Now here's the host of Time for Hope, Dr. Frida Cruz. As always, we are so glad you joined us for another edition of Time for Hope. I'm Dr. Freddy Cruz, your host, and today I would like to welcome as my guest, author and psychologist, Dr. Ron Welch. Dr. Welch serves on the faculty of Denver Seminary and has over 20 years of experience in clinical psychology and counseling. Today, Dr. Welch joins me to discuss his book titled, the controlling husband. As a clinical psychologist, Dr. Welch has heard many women in controlling marriages pour out their hearts. As a recovering controlling husband himself, Dr. Welch understands both sides of the issue. You will want to stay with us as Dr. Welch and I dig deeper into the subject of how controlling husbands develop why women sometimes allow themselves to be controlled, and some practical strategies to help both husband and wife transform the power and control issues in their marriages. And Ron, it's great having you on Time for Hope. And I want to tell you, it's, you've written a great book. Thank you. And a, with my own counseling experience, I found this uh, in many marriages, mm -hmm. in many marriages. So I, I want to compliment you. You've Thank done you. a great job. And we're going to see if we can get uh, these, uh, your thoughts, your directions, and sure. your keys and so forth out uh, to our viewers mm -hmm. today. Um, I, I've been doing this since 1997. Mm -hmm. And we just went worldwide this year. And secondly, I've never appeared on TV before uh, in an arm cast. <laughs> so I, I want to tell you, I'm not Humpty Dumpty, and I was not sitting on a wall. But I did have a very great and serious fall yes. that it's taking several weeks to recover from. Mm -hmm. But praise the Lord, I am recovering. Good. And uh, hopefully by next showtime, uh, I'll be out of this uh, cast and uh, probably in physical therapy, which can be great pain right. and so on and so forth. But God's been so good to me through this. Mm -hmm. And you know, he never allows us to go through anything mm -hmm. that we aren't to drain. I, I used to tell my clients, this was a favorite saying of mm -hmm. mine, when they were going through a hard time, drain it dry. Mm -hmm. Don't let it pass. Don't go through all of this mm -hmm. without uh, learning from it and getting yeah. something out of it that will put you forward in life. You agree with me I on do. that, don't I do. you? I absolutely. You, you you always have experiences and you never quite know what God's going to do with that. And then the next thing you know, you look back in hindsight and you look at what's happened and you can see all the work that he's done in your life that you never even expected or could possibly have imagined. Yeah. You know, even it's amazing when you read the scriptures that you find even before we were conceived, mm -hmm. back in eternity, way back mm -hmm. there in eternity, uh, God knew exactly mm -hmm. Uh, when we were going to be born, what he had in mind for us, and mm -hmm. about our whole lives. But we fail to grasp that some mm -hmm. way or other. Mm -hmm. I think there is a time in our lives when we focus more on what we want, and we think about what our desires are and our goals are, and then when we, when we really let ourselves allow God to, to move us in the direction that he desires, all sorts of things happen that we couldn't have possibly come up with on our own. Well, I'll tell you one thing has to happen, and I teach this quite openly, and that is we have to let go of control. I agree. Uh, with God, we have to have a surrendered mm -hmm. will and a surrendered heart. Yeah. And uh, if we'll give that to Him, He can mm -hmm. He can work miracles in, in our lives. And you learned that to be uh, true in your marriage, didn't you? I, I wish I had learned that a lot earlier. I. Uh, I, I made a lot of mistakes, and then there were a lot of, there's a lot of pain that my wife Jan has had to go through over the years. Um, 
I'm a slow learner. That's why when you introduced me, you mentioned I was a recovering, controlling husband. And that's pretty much how I feel. It's a day-to-day -day kind of battle to remember that my, my job is to serve her, to, to be there for my family, to build them up and empower them. And it's so easy to get caught up in my own goals or what I need to do or what I want. And letting go of the control is really, really hard. Yes. And that's a lot of what this book is about, is trying to suggest that as long as you're trying to meet your own needs and try to become who you want to be, it's really hard to think of your, your wife or your family first. Yes, it has to do with that uh, alpha male problem, does it not? Yeah. Yeah, the big, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the big monkey in the crowd and yes. the big this yes. in the crowd. You know, we learned that in the sandbox. I mean, as early as, as, as kindergarten, when Johnny comes in with, to the sandbox and Frankie's there with his nice toy and Johnny has to decide, you know, do I want to go take that toy or is it Frankie's toy? And then you, you, you get into athletics where the, the people who are the strongest athletes, they're encouraged to knock down the other guy and run over him with the ball. And then you get into uh, the workplace and the people that are in control tend to get their way. Um, I do a lot of work with an organization called Cadence International. I'm on the board for Cadence. It's an international missions organization to the military. And I go around the world talking with military families and the soldiers talk about how hard it is to give orders out in the field and then come home and say, yes, honey, whatever you would like. And, and what do the kids want? And, and law enforcement officers tell me the same kind of thing. It's so hard to be in control when you're supposed to do your job well and then come home and try to serve other people. And it gets difficult for people because they, they have trouble with those roles. Well, we served a military church. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm having some allergy problems these <laughs> days. And that was something that the women mm -hmm. shared with me mm -hmm. because they were in full control having to look after everything while their husbands were away yes. Uh, yes. in war or uh, mm -hmm. in other places and uh, so forth. And suddenly when they came home, very often they wanted to pick up where they left off. Right. And they didn't give those wives a right. chance. And right. man, they didn't know how to just uh -huh. suddenly hand everything over to him. Mm -hmm. Plus and the wives are saying, we've been doing pretty well on our yeah, own here. Right? Yeah, <laughs> and they did. That right. was, so, that was right. true so often. Right. Uh, um, they, they often so did, mm -hmm. did a great job mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. But I've even heard since we left that church many years ago that some of them actually didn't make it. They divorced mm -hmm. and uh, so they couldn't, couldn't readjust. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how often that happens with military mm -hmm. families. A lot. A lot. It's yeah. a sad, it's, yeah. it's sad that that is true. So anyway, we want to be looking at the difference uh, mm -hmm. as we go through two shows. I'm going to do okay. two shows Great. with you on this Great. book. On the difference between being a controlling husband mm -hmm. and one that is violent physically and a physically harmful mm -hmm. husband. Because I've had many uh, situations in my own counseling where I had to advise the women to get out for their own safety. Right. And you and I both are right. on this. Right. Uh, are on the same wavelength there, mm -hmm. uh, that if, if they're being harmed and abused physically, mm -hmm. they've got to make arrangements to get out. But at the same time, they must know mm -hmm. that that's the worst time and that's the most right. unsafe time. Right. So that it takes, you just don't up and pack and leave. Uh, you've got to have some help mm -hmm. in kind of, you know, slipping out mm -hmm. uh, when this kind of thing is going on. And I've helped many a woman. Mm -hmm. I've helped many a woman slip out of a, in a physically abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And they have to understand, going by the, the scriptural teachings on submission, because mm -hmm. I was always mm -hmm. connected with a church sure. and Christian ministry and that kind of thing, that God doesn't expect this. This is not something God says that you've got to submit to. You don't have to submit to mm -hmm. physical violence. Come on, talk to me about it. You know, one of the referral questions I get is a wife will call and say, my husband and my pastor told me if I just learned to submit better, 
my marital problems would I go away. I heard it over and yep. over and over. What about go home and pray? Mm -hmm. and, and then you would think maybe the pastor and the males would be the ones who would cause the most difficulty. For some of these women that call me, the people that put the most pressure on them are other women in the church that will say, well, Absolutely. if you were just closer to God, if you were yeah. praying and in the Word, yeah. you wouldn't have these problems with Him. Mm. And that creates so much guilt and shame for mm -hmm. the woman who's trying to understand what that looks like mm -hmm. and how to, how to be a good Christian wife or, and how to, how to love her husband when mm -hmm. he's doing things that are very hard to love yeah. and that are not acceptable. There's a, lot of, there's a world of difference in submitting to abusive physical harm and respecting and seeing yes. as the head, yes. the headship issue here mm -hmm. and giving him that rightful place mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, in the marriage and in the family and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So. We, I hope we're going to be helping many women today so. understand the difference. So. We get prayer requests quite regularly about being women being in abusive relationships mm -hmm. and continuing to stay in them. Another thing we get a lot of requests, prayer requests about is is that men are ha continuing to have affairs mm -hmm. and the women are staying mm -hmm. in those relationships. Mm -hmm. So they're just, you. I mean, this book could have been twice as thick and you could have <laughs> taken up a lot, <laughs> a lot of things and we'll touch on some of those mm -hmm. things today. Being another counselor and mm -hmm. having uh, seen some of the same situations, yeah. that helps me a lot when I have a guest come on board. They're telling me it's time to go okay. and so we'll be right back. We have all witnessed it a few times, the bride and groom each taking a candle and lighting the unity candle, symbolizing they are becoming one. While they are going through the motions of formalizing and declaring their covenant and commitment to each other to love, cherish, and remain faithful forever, visions of a blissful and love-filled honeymoon dance through their heads. Most marriages include a honeymoon stage, during which time each partner believes he or she has found the one person in all of the world who wants to and can meet all of his or her needs. While the endorphins flow, Honeymooners embrace the illusion that this is the way it's going to be for the rest of their lives. The reality is that all couples will eventually hit the inevitable marital rapids. There is no perfect merging. The honeymoon will not last forever. Within a few weeks or months at the most, and some have been truthful enough to report while on their honeymoon, trouble shows up in paradise. Very early on, and usually imperceptibly, marital partners began to dance to the drums of power struggles, poor or destructive communication, emotional wounding, selfishness, self-doubt, unmet needs, unrealistic expectations, distrust, sometimes physical abuse, and other foxes that spoil the vine of marriage. When you realize that your mate and marriage are imperfect, instead of throwing in the towel, as too many do, or trying to change each other unless there is physical violence or prolonged and persistent verbal and emotional abuse, resolve to change your marriage into the one that you have always wanted. This can be done by learning to listen to your spouse, by identifying and validating his or her love and relationship needs, and asking your mate to do the same for you by viewing problems as belonging to both of you and by resolving to work on them together by attacking the problems and not each other. Avoid the following strategies when you engage in conflict. Discounting your partner's needs, withdrawing, threatening harm, blaming, belittling, guilt-tripping, and punishing 
partner by withholding pleasure or affection. And don't hesitate to seek available pastoral and or professional help. The best treatise on love is found in 1 Corinthians 13 of the Holy Scriptures. Read it regularly. Thanks for staying with us on Time for Hope. Our guest for today is Dr. Ron Welch, and we're talking about his book titled The Controlling Husband. And Ron, there are some things you've brought out about controlling husbands that those that don't want to be a controlling husband any, anymore mm -hmm. most overcome. And control through, you. And the three ways, or three or four ways, they control through intimidation. It's yeah. it's it's hard to understand exactly why we do what we do. Those of us who have who have kind of lived this way with our families, I, I'm not a bad guy. You don't appear you know, to be a in, bad guy. In general, guy. I'm not a mean guy. I don't want to control people, but I'm a very insecure guy. You brought that out, anxiety, fear, mm -hmm. and what was the other three things that, uh, that you learned at home, actually? Well, sometimes it has to do with, well, let me give you an example. When I was asking my wife where we would want to go for dinner, mm -hmm. I wasn't really asking her where she wanted to go for dinner. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start a conversation about dinner so I could tell her how much I wanted to go get barbecue. Does uh -huh. that make sense? Uh -huh. And so. It wasn't for the purpose of saying, I really want to know how I can serve you and take you where you want to go tonight or uh -huh. cook you whatever you want to eat. Uh -huh. It was, I want to start the conversation so I can tell you what I would like. Uh -huh. And when this really hit home, God just slapped me across the face when I started seeing my young sons talk to her the same way. They would tell her what they wanted or tell her where she needed to be or what she needed to do for them. And I would give them the father election and say, don't talk to your mother that way. You're supposed to respect her. And I remember one day, clear as, as day, my God just kind of slapped me across the face and said, who do you think they're learning it from? You're, you're teaching them to disrespect women and to disrespect their mother. And I started looking at my life and how I had done that, not just with my wife, but with a lot of people for a lot of years. And it had to do with trying to present this image to everyone else of how competent and in control I was, because I was scared to death that things would fall apart if I wasn't. And I wasn't very good at trusting God, because I'd send him the emails. I'd tell him all of my directions of what I thought he wanted, right, yeah. or what I, he should do. But in my heart, I was pretty much certain the only way things would be okay is if I took care of them myself. You're, you were actually living in fear of losing control. Yes. Of your Every life, day. period, Every and day. that had to start back in your family of it origin, did. right? It did. My, so many of our issues date back to our families of origin. My dad was, was somewhat controlling. He, he certainly wasn't as bad as me, but um, my mom was, God bless her, she was, the glass wasn't half full, it was draining rapidly, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, and, and she could see all the dangers around every corner. So I grew up learning to try to see what might go wrong, mm -hmm. and I got pretty good at trying to prevent some of those bad mm -hmm. things, which probably wasn't a good thing because then I started believing I was actually in control. You could fix things. You could fix everything, right? A few years ago, my, my mom passed away. My dad passed away before that. I had a lot of things in my marriage that were falling apart. I was working in the federal prison systems as a psychologist and involved in riots and suicide attempts, and my life was falling apart. I was, I was a pretty bad father and a pretty bad husband. And and I had to do something to try to change that tide. You know, psychologists are not supposed to have these problems. You would think I would be able to, you know, to take they, my own they've medicine, got right? it all yeah. together, right? That's, that's what's supposed to be true. Unfortunately, it's not um, true. It's, it's not, not true, true of a lot of leaders yeah. and a lot of uh, those that have degrees and so on and so forth. But they not a lot of them aren't as honest and coming forth as you are. Well, you know there's a lot of pastors that have this issue Absolutely. where they want to be in control of the church yeah. and they don't want to let people grow and let God develop all the skills they have in their congregation. Yeah. It's just you get to this point where you think the worst thing that could be happen that could happen would be if you would would lose control mm -hmm. and you couldn't be in charge of anything. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty much what happened in my life. Yeah, that's something we're telling ourselves. We're not aware we're telling ourselves that, mm -hmm. but we are telling ourselves that. Um, it's, it's, this, 
It's this idea of selfishness that seems mm -hmm. to yes, resonate in our that culture. Out over and over throughout your book, which I greatly appreciate. I am very concerned about two models of marriage in the country right now. The one model says, I don't know if you know this, but there's college freshmen that will come in saying they expect to be married 2.8 times. They just figure they'll be divorced a couple times. Well, I would see that. I can easily see that. Uh, and you bring, I believe it's in your book that it's brought out, that they see the first one as a trial. Yes, a starter move, marriage. Yeah, yes. a starter marriage yes. to move them on. Right. To. There was even a, a show in the USA Network a few years ago called The Starter Wife. Mm -hmm. They were going to trade her in for, mm -hmm. it's the buyer's remorse, mm -hmm. you know, i got to find a better model. Yeah. And, and that's all based on if you don't meet my needs, then I don't really need to be married to you mm -hmm. anymore. The alternative is I'm in this marriage to serve you, to build you up, to help you grow closer to God, to create a, a family where our children grow up mm -hmm. knowing God and loving God. And those two competing models they don't are, come together. they don't come together at all. Uh, You've got to choose. Unless a couple works on bringing That's them right. together a and don't see it as a starter marriage, but want to keep it as a right. long-term marriage. And that's what my, one of my messages in the book is, is that if a husband, and it can be a wife, by the way, it's not like the Absolutely. only controlling people are husbands. Women are, can be very <laughs> controlling also. But whoever is doing that has to decide on a daily basis, even on a minute by minute basis, I have to care more about what is happening with my wife's relationship with God, with my children, how they're feeling loved and respected and honored. I have to prioritize that over whether I get to eat where I want to or not. Yes. And I can remember even with my own marriage that there were many, many times that issues would arise, uh, but I always, always made a point of, uh, before I made a decision, mm -hmm. is to consider how my children would fit into yes. that. And mm -hmm. It has paid off in mm -hmm. rich dividends mm -hmm. uh, today because they're there for me. Right. And right. They're, uh, they're always there for me. And uh, they, I guess they just realized mm -hmm. that. But I was reared by a, not just an authority figure mm -hmm. father, but by an authoritarian mm -hmm. father. But I just happened to be his pick, <laughs> uh, his pet, okay? Mm -hmm. so that, that helped me out a whole right. lot there. Right. But he, he had three daughters and one son. And actually, he raised some good, some strong daughters in mm -hmm. spite of his control issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was very happy about that, that he allowed us to, mm -hmm. to grow uh, as individuals and uh, so forth in the process. So and I, you know, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's not like... I could have controlled Jan without her allowing that. But she grew up in a family somewhat like you described, only without the empowerment. Her dad was very dominant, very controlling, and taught her very early that it was probably better not to fight the battle, to just mm -hmm. let it go and give in. And when she did that with me in our marriage, she came in thinking, wow, Prince Charming's going to ride in, and uh -huh. all of this stuff from my childhood will go away, and he'll love me and care for me. And then I ended up doing very similar things to the way her dad treated her. Yeah. And so oh. she came away thinking, oh, this is, what, yeah. this is what love is, this is what a Christian marriage is. So it was really hard when a controlling husband married someone who's a, been used to been being, used to being controlled. controlled. Yes, exactly. Yes, and in some degrees that was true of me, mm -hmm. uh, even early mm -hmm. on in the marriage and uh, so forth. So it will carry over uh, mm -hmm. either way, but I don't know how my dad managed to do both, yeah. <laughs> right? Just, yeah. uh, you know, to, uh, yeah. uh, to do both. But um, well, uh, there, we're, we're going to be doing uh, picking up next week yes. where we leave off. So I want to I want to leave off with this question, mm -hmm. Ron. And if you have time to answer it really quick, or I just will. just le so that they will like, mm -hmm. tune in again to hear the rest okay. of the story next sure. week. Why do women stay in these controlling marriages? I think they stay in the marriages because they learn to feel helpless and they don't think there's anything they can Is do it about it. Is it learned helplessness or they learn it? I think it may be from their past in some ways, previous relationships or their family, but at other times it's just easier not to fight. And I think that's the worst thing you can do is just give in and say, you know what, we'll just let it go. Yeah. 
that's a good that's a good thought to go out on. We'll pick it pick up on it next week, right. and also uh, give them a forward look, give them hope mm -hmm. that their marriage can be transformed. Okay, so yes. don't forget you got to help me remember where I we will. pick up for next week, and we uh, I have some things to share with you. Don't go away. I have a, a couple of. Uh, letters from our notes or texts or something like that from our viewers and the first one is dear Dr. Frida my husband is involved in an adulterous relationship and it is not the first time I need healing from the hurt and pain and it is a very painful happening uh, this has caused so I can move on I am experiencing a lot of grief because of this. Please pray for me. But one thing in your favor uh, is that you have the desire to move on. Either get this situation straightened out or move on. You agree with me on that, yes, don't you? And then I have a note of praise, which encourages me greatly uh, as, uh, as I prepare for Time for Hope. Dear Dr. Frieda, I just had to write and tell you how much your show has given me some hope. And that's exactly why I named it that. That's, uh, and then hallelujah for your show. I always say Jesus came to give us hope in this hopeless life. And it can be feel, a life can be filled with a lot of hopelessness. Time for Hope is an awesome program, and I'm glad to have found it, and thank you for that. It humbles me, and also uh, I greatly appreciate it all at the same time. Now, the next thing I would like you to do is if you have not considered contributing to Time for Hope and helping us with the expenses of carrying on this now worldwide uh, a program that you would consider doing that and then uh, the other thing that I want you to do is make sure you join us again next week on Time for Hope. A free fact sheet that contains additional information about today's topic is available upon request from our ministry. You can also receive a copy of today's resource for a contribution of any amount to the Time for Hope ministry. Call us at 800-669-9133. Write us at Post Office Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304. Or visit our website at timeforhope.org. When you call or write, prayerfully consider a donation to our ministry. Our ministry's mission is to offer hope to discouraged and hurting people. As we continue to give out messages of hope, a financial gift of any amount to support this ministry will be greatly appreciated. When you do this, you are joining us in offering hope to many viewers seeking help and hope for their situation. This will also enable us to inform and inspire some viewers to expand our mission as they learn and in turn can minister more effectively to hurting people around them. To see this program again online, go to our website or search for Time for Hope TV on YouTube, iTunes, and Facebook. Until next time, have a great week. And remember, it is time for hope.